Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of The Growth Show, where we talk around personal development, change, mindset, teamship, leadership, all of the amazing things that help people fulfill their potential, whether that be individually or collectively. And this week, we are joined by an incredible friend of mine, I'm proud to say is a friend of mine, um, but also someone that is an unbelievable achiever, um, Tamara Taylor. Thank you so much, Tammy, for being here with us. Hi, Ollie. How are you doing? Yeah, I, I don't know how delighted Tammy is that she's got to spend an hour with me, but luckily she can do it virtually, which is what it's all about. Thank goodness. Um, Tammy, I thought, I just, Tam, yeah, Tam, I just thought it would be great if, if you can just give everyone yeah, a, a flavour, if you like, of your unbelievable career to date, both on and off the rugby field. So, you know, who is Tamara Taylor? Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> I love introducing myself, thankfully. Um, so I played for England for 13 years, um, England women's team, rugby player. Um, I got my first cap in 2005 and I've played 115 times. So I'm in the top four people um, capped for England, male and female, um, ever at the moment. Although there's a few people behind me uh, creeping up at the moment. Um, I've always like worked around kind of rugby. I've been a community rugby coach um, for years and I'm now a coach developer um, working with England Rugby. So rugby has been a massive part of my life for a long time. Um, I currently live in the Northeast. And I'm still playing, still hanging on to my playing days, um, but playing for Saracens this year, which has been um, a really exciting change for me, having played for a team in the Northeast for a very long time, over a decade. Um, so now playing for Saris and trying to decide what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, Ollie. <laughs> well, we can we can touch upon that as well as we go through. because It's one of the things I obviously want to ask around. But 115 caps, right, for your country. Like that, that that's, is a level of consistency of performance, right? That merits you being selected 115 times for your country. So w what would you put that down to? Like that consistency of performance some people say, you know, it's easy to win one game or win a premiership or win a championship or whatever else it might be, but the hardest thing is staying there. So what, how would you contrast winning your first cap to then winning 115 of them? And what was the keys to that sort of success? Um, I think, like, people talk about super strengths of players and, and what's your X factor. Um, and I think for me, it was always my work rate. I was always prepared to go and do other people's jobs if necessary to go over to that side of the pitch and that side of the pitch and just you know repetitive doing the jobs that maybe not everybody wanted to do or maybe not the big high flying try scoring breaking through people um but that was kind of what my game was built on that I would work as hard as I possibly could for every single minute that um I was selected onto that pitch so it sounds a bit um yeah it doesn't sound quite as exciting and um uh yeah as in the forefront but that was always that was something that w was a given for me um and I guess in terms of that you know now looking at things as a coach if you've got people who are playing consistently and filling some of those gaps and doing some jobs it allows other people to be able to be the try scorers you know the big hitters um so I think that's that was probably what my kind of point of difference was but then I mean on that lots of people sort of say you know articulating what good looks like or whatever else but how did you define that success for you as you progressed through your career? Did it, did it, did it change? Did it morph as, as you went through? And what were always the sort of non-negotiables for you in terms of motivation, success factors that you kind of focused on that ultimately brought you, you know, 115 caps for your country? Um, that's a very big question, Holly. Um, I think I never took any of it for granted. So I never, I never felt like, oh yeah, I'll be selected into this tournament, I'll be selected into this game. So that motivation that drove me always away from the pitch to try and make sure that I did all my sessions, that I got as prepared as I possibly could um, because I never, I never expected to be selected. I was always waiting for the phone call or the email or the, you know, however we got told. Um, and I think that kind of, that drove me that it's negative in that there's a kind of guilt feeling related to it. You don't want to let anybody down. Um, but the positive side of it is that it, it keeps you motivated and it makes, all, makes sure that you do your, your extras, basically, is how we used to, to call them. 
Um, and I think always trying to stay true to myself as a player. You know, I went through quite a lot of, of coaches and people will always want different things from different players and they'll always see the game slightly differently. Um, but knowing that I was what I was and I wasn't necessarily, there's obviously always bits you can change and get better at, but you've got to know that this is, this is the package, this is what people are going to get. And as long as you can be the best at that, I'm never going to be somebody else. I can't try and keep emulating being a different player because I don't have some of those attributes and, and it's not what's got me success so far. So I think sometimes you've got to just, yeah, keep backing yourself a little bit, even if sometimes others around you don't or you feel like they're not. I mean, there's two things I want to ask them. I'm like, how did you deal with that, you know, an emotional roller coaster or psychological challenge of, you said, I don't know if there's examples or but you know, these people aren't backing me, but I'm backing myself. Like, how did you, you know, maintain that level of sort of self-esteem, self-confidence in order to, to keep pushing forward when, I don't know, others around you or maybe coaches that, you, that were important or relevant to you weren't doing the same thing? It's really hard. And I don't think, I don't think there's anyone in, probably in sport or life that can say that they've done it consistently well every time and you'll always have drops where you you believe the people that are telling you that you're not going to come back from an injury or you're not good enough anymore um you'll always have doubts and I think some of it is is putting on a bit of a show and pretending that it's not bothering you so that people don't see it and you can then you buy yourself a bit of time internally I think then to kind of fill in some of the gaps and try and get yourself back back on track um some of it is using that as fuel. So I'm quite a kind of rebellious person by nature. Um, and if people tell me that I can't do something, then some of that will spark a little bit of a fire in me. Not always, but um, if I'm in the in the right positive frame of mind, then it can. So that, that can be a real motivator to try and prove people wrong. Um, and then I, I guess some of it is having that support network around you of the people who do believe in you or, or who will listen to you when you're struggling to be able to talk to them, tell them you're worried, tell them you're not sure if you're going to succeed and for them to be able to just sometimes listen and say, yeah, it's going to be tough, but together, what kind of coping mechanisms can we put in place? You know, how can I help you do some of your training? How can we, um, how can we fix this? So probably at different times in my career, I've kind of gone between those three and, and on the bit of, of sort of leveraging you know, your support network around you, how how easy did you find that or how did you set, you know, did you do certain things to, that you, you know, to set certain specific people that you trusted more or that you confided in more that, I don't know, or whose opinions you valued more that, that, that did result in you sort of coming back stronger? I think, you know, speaking to lots of people in, in, in the world that we move in within Optimus Performance, Lots of people aren't really sure who, who, who is a value, right? Who actually can deliver insightful, useful, helpful commentary. So how did you separate the, the good from the bad? <laughs> um, my parents probably played quite a big part. So they've always been really supportive. And we had the kind of relationship through my career where I could go to them and I could tell them all of the bad things that I was feeling and you know, I didn't think this selection was right and I didn't feel valued here and I could get all that out and it didn't it didn't impact on you know, it wasn't to a teammate who might, you know, my kind of negativity might have impacted on them. It was completely away from the game. Um, and obviously, as, as my parents who always have my best interests at heart, but they've also, you know, had the ability to say, no, Tamara, you, you're being a bit stupid here. <laughs> you need to put yourself together. Um, so in terms of a sounding board, they've always been pretty important to me. I did struggle, I think, to find that kind of mentor or that that support closer into rugby. I never, I never wanted to burden the the players around me with like if I wasn't feeling confident, I didn't want them to to pick up on that. So I, I did quite a lot of hiding um, about my lack of confidence through my career. And I think you've got to have a really good relationship with a coach or you know people in that kind of selection bracket to to have the confidence to say, look, I don't. I'm not feeling very sure about myself because ultimately you're telling someone who's selecting you or not selecting you that you're not feeling very confident or you're a bit worried about something and that's backfired on me in the past so 
if you, it's definitely not a good or bad thing, but I just think that maybe um, it's difficult to have that relationship with effectively your boss or the person who's kind of making those decisions um, on your behalf. You've got to have yeah, a really good trust relationship to not think that they'll use it against you in terms of selection. I mean, trust is obviously we hear about all the time. Like, what um, is there anything you would do to, like, listening to that? I'm wondering if, I mean, so do you feel like maybe if you had that level of next level of trust or ability to go to someone, you might have been even better than the player that you were? I mean, you're already pretty outstanding, but you know, you'd have gone further because because of that. Yeah, but it's that easy breakdown. to say, isn't it? To be like, oh yeah, if I'd had this and this and this in my career, imagine. Um, but I definitely think for me mentally and kind of coming out the other side of rugby now, um, you can, I see some of those kind of negative behaviours that I obviously trapped and suppressed for quite a long time, you know, the, the anxiety around selection or things going wrong. And because you're just in that everyday flow of, must put my head down, must work hard. Okay, few I've got selected. Then you stress again, then you get selected. It's just like a, a, com- a continual kind of ebb and flow. And when you come out the other side of it, um, you realize that actually those anxious times have had probably quite a, a negative effect um, on me now. And I'm having to like work out how to deal with that kind of like fear of failure stuff that I, I literally just hid from for, for most of my career, just trying to just keep going. Um, and now you're sort of coming into the real world a bit more, I think. Had I, I do feel like had I had someone who was close enough to rugby, but not to my environment that I could have just said, look, I am so worried about this. This stresses me out every day. I never think I'm going to get selected. I, I don't feel like I'm supposed to be there every time I take to the pitch. And for them not to have that judgment of me as a rugby player, but to help me with some coping mechanisms, um, I definitely think that would have that would have supported me probably mentally, whether I would have played better or not, I don't know. Um, but I think coming out of the sort of the back end of it now, I definitely think that would ha- have helped me mentally. So, so to, I mean, uh, this wasn't one of my questions, but I want to ask it anyway. Well, um, w- what would you say to the Tamara Taylor getting her first cap now, if, if you could go back and, and like listening to you speak, you've had such an incredible successful career. And yet it also feels like, throughout you know large parts of it you were filled with sort of self-doubt or anxiety and worry which I think loads and loads of people can relate to myself included right so what what um what would you say to that Tamara Taylor on you know cap one the euphoria of you've just got your first you know you played your first game for England or you're about to play your first game for England but what would you say to, to I don't know to do differently or to manage that situation now um probably two things so one around that find somebody who who's close enough to rugby but far enough away to, from rugby that you can you can talk to about that and you can get your nervous energy out without feeling like you're being judged but also hopefully on the back of that enjoy the journey more I think sometimes when I look back at my career I've played for so long that I've played in so many amazing tournaments played with so many brilliant players and i I got myself so worried about my own performance of letting people down that I definitely didn't enjoy the journey um, as much as I should have done. And I can remember um, Alex Matthews actually, a couple of years ago in the squad, she was saying like, we need to make memories, we need to enjoy the journey. And I can remember thinking, I just can't do that. Like I'm too stressed, like internally, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have let anyone know that I was super stressed, but, I feel like I missed out a bit on some of that enjoyment factor of, you know, how great it is and, and what an absolute, you know, amazing time I, I did have, but I didn't allow myself to enjoy it as much. So I definitely tell myself to enjoy it more. And I mean, on that, Tam, just to, just to in, out of interest with the, um, you said right at the beginning of, of this, and you've said it a couple of times or all the way through so far that you know, one of your drivers or motives that enabled you to be so sort of consistent as a performer was, you didn't want to let anyone else out down around you. So I'm. I mean, I know you're still involved with Sarries now. You've you know you've moved away from the England squad, uh, but but like how how's that sort of played out for you of being you know, in England squad, full time professional, you know, now playing at Saracens? Like, is that sort of psychology of I, I don't want to let anyone else down still prevalent, or if as 
time, age, maturity or whatever you know, enabled you to, I don't know, focus more on your internal drivers rather than worrying about everybody else? Um, I'd like to say yes, that I've grown up and I'm experienced. But um, no, I'd, I think probably it's going to take me to finish playing and not have the kind of selection pressures and, and all of that and to start kind of grounding myself again back in terms of look it's not life and death if you don't get selected and some of the feelings that you get even you know at club that remind me of how stressed I was at England it's like it's not a positive mental loop to be in um, and I don't, I don't know if you can break that without finishing playing because I've always been worried about it it's always been kind of like yeah a bit of a, a bit of a repetitive loop um, mentally for me so it's been a different challenge playing at, at Saracens this season, um, but it's probably actually reminded me a bit more of of England in terms of that, you know, top of the table, like that need to perform. Whereas the team I was playing for previously, it was a lot more about development, um, you know, trying to take small wins. And now, you know, I'm playing for a team who's right at the top. And it is, yeah, the similarities, I think, between playing for Saracens and England are a lot more clear cut in terms of that performance and, and pressure to perform bit. So yeah, unfortunately I don't think it's gone yet. Um but at least I'm I'm a lot more aware of it now, I yeah. think, than I was when I used to hide it. And and then but when you were playing throughout this whole you know your whole career's been you know on paper absolutely fantastic, right? I mean if you were to write a script as a 16 year old girl or 10 year old girl saying, look by the time I get into my 30s, this is what I'm going to have done. And this is what my epitaph is going to say. You know, it's a pretty impressive list, right? So so how did you manage to stay positive throughout that whole experience, you know, to where you are to date, even though you had, I don't know, these elements of self-doubt or anxieties creeping in or injuries or whatever else? What was the thing that you latched onto that was the... Yeah, made made Tammy smile and kept you positive and pushed you through the difficult situations that you that you may have encountered. Um, definitely the the players around me. Um, I think once you've had a big injury, you know what it's like in terms of that <clears throat> that mental balance and and needing to have some some support and being able to kind of tap into some of the girls who've also been in those sort of situations. You know, Nolly Waterman, for example, like she's been injured quite a lot and and always managed to get herself back um to the top of her game so we would have good conversations around you know around that sort of thing and, and rehabbing from injury and obviously there's there's always people who are selected and not selected and being able to kind of have a common ground um with some of those players in the negative times meant that you didn't feel like you were alone and that in itself kind of breathes a bit of like oh it's not just me it's not just poor me pity party actually this is just a cycle this happens you get injured you fall out of favor you fight back um so that you know as much as I've said it's it's a, a difficult thing and I had a lot of anxiety around it it's also builds your resilience because you that's what life is isn't it it doesn't it's not great every day and things go wrong so a big part of kind of my playing career in that bringing it back to the positive has been that the bad things have happened I've regrouped, I've found people who've also had the bad things, we've talked about it, we've reconciled that it's not the worst thing ever, we can come back from it. So there's definitely strength in numbers and not feeling like you're on your own. Yeah, the importance of that shared experience kind of thing. And um, I mean, one thing I, I was going to ask you around was sort of change. And you, we mentioned you've had, uh, from a playing career, it's been relatively consistent, right? You, you were at the same club for pretty much all of your career, you you play for England for pretty much all, all of your career. Um, but you know, there was a moment where, you know, you left your, your former club in DMP and, and moved to Sarries. So the North East all the way down to the sort of North London. What, you know, how was that as a, like, I, I don't want to know the ins and outs of the, you know, the dealings. I mean, but in terms of the uncertainty of that, the change of that, the excitement of that, you know, you, as you said, you're going from a development team to a team that's going to win the league. Like, what was the, how did you manage that? How did you deal with that uncertainty and embrace it all? And what were the things that went through your mind? Um, again, that kind of 
feeling really positive, then feeling really negative, then feeling really excited, then feeling really scared, um, which just seems to be a theme of my life. I think it's just, yeah, top of a roller coaster, bottom of a roller coaster. It was a really uncertain time for everyone in the world in terms of like lockdown, coronavirus, what's going on. Um, coming back to rugby when the rest of the country was in lockdown as well. And what does that look like? So there was a lot of uncertainty anyway. Um, and then sort of towards the end of that pre-season period, ending up moving from DMP to Sarries, um, not in the most comfortable of situations without going into too much detail, but um, it wasn't necessarily what I wanted. I didn't necessarily want to leave the club that I'd put a lot of my love and my heart into for 14 years. Um, but the opportunity at Surrey is, like you said, amazing to, to be able to play towards the end of my career for a team that's at the top of the league. I've not, not done that in a very long time from a, um, from a sense of a club and the kind of the different challenges that that brings, um, not just as a player, but as a, um, an assistant coach as well, is good for me. It's an uncomfortable situation, but I know that in the long run, if I can get through this, it'll make me a better coach. It'll help me, you know, with that mental bit around, actually you can cope with these stressful situations where you're worrying about selection, you're worrying about injury. Um, and although it's difficult, it is difficult to travel and, and the change in general, but it's something that if you don't embrace it, then why did you bother doing it in the first place? So. And, and what, um, what, what were the things that really excited you about the, you know, about, the change you know what what were the things that you really loved and looked forward to and relished and you know what why you did it in the first place but so you know and i you know I'm, i you can obviously give us some of the detail but it's more around sort of your emotive state and what were the things that really excited you from a, a change perspective i think sometimes it is just change isn't it that that you can take that as really scary or you can take it as exciting um and to have done something, you know, played for the same club for a long period of time, I was excited about the unknown, about not knowing what it was going to be like. Obviously, I had some preconceived ideas, but I went down, I went and spoke to the coaching staff um, <clears throat> and the management staff. I went and joined in a bit with training, watched training. So all of that was quite a buzz to be, oh, this is a new environment. Like, think of the opportunities. You've got amazing players, you know, cracking players. Saris have always been here in the, the top three probably um, of the premiership they've always been a team that have had good infrastructure around them um, good support from the club so I was excited about you know where that that could go how I could help try and support that you know I've got tons of experience but can I translate that into supporting a team who are top end um, so I was excited about challenging myself um, nervous don't get me wrong really really nervous about it but I think the, for me, the change was exciting. It was, it opened a door of possibilities and opportunities to, to grow myself as a person, as a coach and a player, um, rather than being really terrifying. Um, and I mean, I'm really fascinated by this sort of uh, yeah, process, but you, you mentioned obviously that you've, you're wearing a sort of a coaching hat as well at the same time as, as sort of a playing hat. What what have you noticed in terms of the differences in to, I don't know, your approach um, or others' approach of being an incredibly successful player to being know, an, an incredibly successful coach? Like what what's the nuances and differences that you see as a as a as performing in both those arenas? I think probably I've coached for a long time, um, and I went from being a head coach last season at DMP to now um, supporting Alex and, and Lewis and Rocky at Surrey's. So that side of it is very different. You know, I was in complete control of the programme. I could make all of those decisions. Um, so now I'm, I'm in a supporting role, which has been really good to be able to learn from the people around me. You know, all three of those coaches have got um, different strengths that I can look at and, and tap into, hopefully, and, and hopefully I can help support them. Um, a lot of my kind of coaching career has been driven by things that I don't want to repeat. So coaches who have made me feel like I'm not in a good place or made me feel not confident or not valued. So a big driver for me is to make sure that I don't repeat history. 
I don't want to coach in the way that some people coach me. I don't get me wrong. I had some, some great coaches as well, but I always look for the bits that I don't want to repeat that. I don't want to do that. So I, I do quite a lot of reflection on my coaching in terms of how, how did that come across? How did that make people feel? I'm thinking, oh, I don't know if that person was a bit on the periphery. Did they understand what, what I was trying to do? Did I miss the mark there? Um, because it's, you know, it's so difficult coaching. Rugby, you've got 30 odd people, all different personalities, all different backgrounds. And just the fact that they're playing different positions requires them to have different attributes. So it's definitely not a uniform of all the same people all wanting, all having the same drivers. So as a coach, it's a really difficult job to try and herd in these people, make sure you hit that individual, make sure the overall plan has got buy-in from everyone, but it looks after the individuals within that team. Um, we say that it's just coaching, but it's not. It's mentoring, it's counselling, it's supporting. Um, it's such a huge job. Um, and I think, I don't know, I don't know whether I'll ever get it right, um, but it's definitely something that, that drives me to try to, keep, to get it right. Yeah, I mean, you, you said you've worked with lots of coaches, some good, some bad. What, what would you say were the characteristics and the, I don't know, the things that they tangibly did, the great ones, the really great ones that you sort of reflect back on, maybe role model against or take bits from? What did they do? How did they make you feel? How do they interact with the squad that, for you, puts them as a, a, a great coach? I'm definitely connected with players, so... You, you want to be authentic to yourself as a coach. So you can't just be, if you're naturally introverted and you start pretending to be an extrovert, that's not you. And you might, that might be what some of the players like, but ultimately you're not going to be true to yourself. So it's just going to end up being a big act and it's very tiring um, and it drains you. So you, you've got to be, whatever your personality is, you've got to draw on that. Um, and I think that having the kind of the ability to connect to people and, and the want, the care to want to go and have a conversation with them. You know, I always thought I like, I'm a very caring person. That's just my nature. Um, and I always thought that was a negative in coaching because I was kind of made to believe that that was a bit soft and, you know, why would, you know, you don't need to care. This is, you, know, you need to make the right decisions. But actually, if I care about the outcomes and I care about my players, that means that they're going to feel more connected and that that kind of caring and connection piece, I think, although I've always been told it's very soft, the more I've, you know, the older I've got as a player, <clears throat> the more coaches I've seen, the best coaches I think really care, um, not just about the game, but about their players as well. So like connection and caring and then the kind of, uh, lots of C's here, but um, consistency as well. I think I've had coaches in the past where, you're having to wait and see whether they're having a good day or a bad day. You're not sure. You don't want to approach them until you know. <clears throat> and just generally in life, that's very difficult when you've got people who are so end of the spectrum that some days you're on eggshells and some days you're the best mate. And I, I think especially in that kind of coaching environment, if you as a player don't know when's the right time to approach someone or is this the right day to say, look, I think maybe this could happen at training that might support the players more. Um, I think that's yeah that's really difficult so trying to be consistent with with behaviors and knowing that you might be having a bad day as a coach as in things might be going wrong but you can't let that impact on how you speak to people or how you behave or if it does you've got to be able to recognize it to you know make the right apologies and make the right amendments and, and how did you find I guess that level of self-awareness and uh, you know, a bit ability to sort of connect all the C's that you, you know, you've mentioned already, right? But how did you find being able to deliver that as a coach, which is the, the big C composed as opposed to a guess as a player where you basically had to look after your own performance, your own delivery. You know, it, it was all about tomorrow and what you delivered first and foremost, then apply it to the team. Whereas the, now your role as a coach is, I need to be connected. I need to make sure everybody is, is in sync. I've got to be consistent with my, my behaviors, my energy, my emotions. Like how, how did you, how did you broach that? How did you manage that? Did anyone help you through that and make you aware of that? What, what, what was the sort of transition piece and how can people learn that? Um, <clears throat> I'm still 
trying to learn it to be honest so um because I'm still playing at the moment and coaching it it is a bit of a conflict um in terms of that internal dialogue you know I'm I want to be selected I want to play but at the same time I'm supporting other forwards as a coach so it, it's a, it is a difficult balance um especially at, at a performance level um rather than a development level um I definitely don't have it right um by any stretch of the imagination and and I do think that coming away from playing will allow me more time to kind of step back and look at the bigger picture of a, a training session or a, a plan and be able to take myself out of it. Um, I think as a player, I probably, I probably did the me stuff away from training. And then when it was a team session, it would be about the team. It's just my nature really. Um, so I found, I found that side easy in terms of what you're saying about how do you separate caring and and consistency and and the connection stuff if I was in a team session I would be doing everything for the team I wouldn't be doing it to make myself look good or to to give myself extras or me more touches of the ball um because my opinion of playing a team sport and playing rugby is that I need to be doing it so that that person over there can do their job and so that person over there is in the right place um and I think that's kind of how I look at it as a coach I want to make sure that the dynamics right that everybody feels like their job is valued um I went into talking of of people who've supported or or that I've looked up to I went into um an under 18s camp with the boys a couple of years ago um when Fletch was still in charge and I went in and watched what they did as a as a coaching group because I wanted to know like how do you get a dynamic right? And um, the biggest thing for me in that the couple of the meetings I went into was that everybody had a voice. It wasn't head coach, this is what we're doing, this is what I've seen. The physio was feeding in, the SNC was feeding in, the manager was like, oh, I noticed this about this player. Yeah, actually, do you know what? He said this to me, I've seen this. And it was just a massive kind of collective group effort of no hierarchy, no, you're the boss, you're the minion. Um, and that, that was quite a big point for me in, in my kind of coaching sort of thought process was that it shouldn't be one person at the top. And I, I guess this is the same for business. I think if you want to get the best out of your staff as a coaching group, if you want to get the best out of your players, everybody needs to feel valued and needs to feel like they've got a voice because otherwise, why are they there if you don't want to use their opinion? But how do you arrive, just on, how do you arrive at decisions then if there's, um, you know, without creating sort of chaos or anarchy where everybody's just inputting and one wants to go left, one wants to go right, one wants to go up, one down. Like, how did you, how have you found or how did you find, whichever the environment was, that a consensus was reached did it need a, a, a head person, or, you know, to, to make the call of like, we're going to go left? Ultimately, thanks everyone for the information. This is where we're going to go. But like, like, how do you see that playing out? Because we hear, yeah. this, hear this a lot, but you also have to add in then time sensitivity, performance pressure, and you know, a decision needs to be made one way or the other. So how, how, do, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, obviously it can't just be a, a free-for-all. I think in terms of, of the communication and everyone being able to input in, it is a, a bit of a free-for-all in that if you've got the right people in the room, you're going to value the information that they're giving to you. But as, yes, as the head coach, I guess there is a hierarchy in terms of the kind of the buck stops with you. You have to make that decision. And, and I think probably the best head coaches or directors of rugby or, you know, whatever bosses are the ones that can sit back and listen, take in information from all those areas and process it into a decision and then and then either back their own decision or have the ability to sell that back to the group so that you get group buy-in. And I, I do think if, even if I've, I've been someone feeding information in and it hasn't been, we've then gone, I want to go left and they want to go right. I think when, when I've had someone making that decision, they've explained why they want to go in that direction. Even if I don't fully agree with it, knowing the why or their why, I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, let's do it. I'll, I'll back you now. It's when people at the top, I think, just make a decision when they go and you think, oh, did you, like, was, like, could I have helped? Did you listen to, no, okay, all right, yeah. You won't say anything. I think that's where you don't get full buy-in from the people around you. Yeah. 
It's a really good point. Well, okay, so I want to go back to monumental moment, 2014, winning a, a, a World Cup. Undoubtedly, that you know the fruits of a lot of time, effort, and hard hard work. So this is a, a massive statement. But what makes a great team? Christ, how many are? <laughs> yeah, and were and were you a great team? Um, we were pretty good. Yeah, definitely. I think um, part of it was there was a group of players who had lost in 2010 that were still there. Um, and I do think there's there's definitely something in that we need to take revenge, you know, that mindset of like, we were so close, I'm not going to let it happen again. And that was certainly, that was a big driver for me. I was constantly thinking in that four year period between 2010 and 2014, are New Zealand doing this? Yeah, but are they doing this? Yeah, but what would they do? Because for me, they, you know, they were the top team, they have been for a long time. So they were always my benchmark of, well, I'm running the stairs at the beach. I wonder if their players are running the stairs at the beach. Bet they're not, bet they're not. Whether they were or not, it didn't matter. It, like for me mentally, um, that was kind of a driver. And I know quite a few of the girls who were in that situation, they were like, right, we need to do this to beat the top. Are they doing this? And and the new girls that came in that hadn't played in the World Cup, that maybe hadn't had those um, those losses in terms of top of the table clashes, I think they fed different energy in, they fed a, why would we be worried, you know, first World Cup, like 2014, let's go, and and that mix of people and that mix of energy, I think, was also really important, and the people not wanting to fail, and the people not worried about failing, because they'd not been there, and if you get that combination right, I think that can be really powerful, um, we also had, we had a lot more time together, so just in terms of actually being able to train as a group, the the camps that led into that 2014 World Cup. We weren't professional, but it was much more like we were professional. We were together um, for larger periods of time. You know, some of the girls took sabbaticals from work to make sure that they could really focus on being a rugby player for that kind of six month lead in or, you know, some people longer than that. Um, So that helped. did, did Did that make it feel even more rewarding just because of the sacrifice that everyone had made? I think it it probably unites you as well as a group of players because you are very aware that someone's had to get a five o'clock train to get to to camp and they were catching up on work three days previous because you know the situation that they're in and and I think that gives a bit of empathy around the group and I'm not now blaming whoever thinking why is she like that today because I've got an understanding that she's been on the back of you know, a three three day shift as a vet on night shift. I don't know, birthing calves or uh, whatever people would do as vets. Um, and I think that understanding around the group as well that that things are gonna you know things are gonna be tough. But I'm not gonna blame anybody because I know that their situation is unique and it's different. And and as we got closer to the World Cup, we knew people would be you know pushing work away to be able to be in that in that bubble a bit more. So that that understanding as well. Um, And we just got certain bits right. You know, we had a good off-field support staff in terms of we brought in a new S&C very last minute, um, but he was really good. He brought new energy. He really pushed us physically much more than we had been previously. And that kind of, that next step up kind of freshened things up. Um, we had a new doctor in who was absolute life and soul. Um, you know, it's like with backroom staff, if you've got people with good energy, um, and he certainly had loads of good energy, and that kind of picks people up a little bit more. Um, we started working with the, the sports psychologist more, and, and she ended up being a really good, a really good go-between. That sounds, you know, I'm not demoting her there, but um, she was able to take the opinions of the players, so we, we formed a leadership group, she could take that information and she could take it to the management and she could take information from the management and, you know, put it out into the, the playing group. And that that really helped us bridge a gap that I think sometimes you have in those high performing environments where the managers are here, the players are here and there's a massive gap of nobody really feeling like they can communicate. And Cherry massively sort of dove through both of, dove, that's not a word, is it? 
dive through um, both of those layers to kind of link them in a bit better. I mean, one thing I listened there, Tam, that was fascinating for me was you had that blend of it, of some had experienced failure and others didn't know what it was about um, from 2010. So a, a major driver was, I, I guess, maybe not feeling that way again, but also you had a barometer of like what great looked like, like what, what the performance criteria was for good. I'm intrigued to see once or to know once you'd won the World Cup in 2014 and now you were the benchmark of what's great and what's good. How did you then move forward? Because you don't have anyone to compare yourself against now because everyone's chasing you. Yeah, I mean, we we're probably not a great barometer of that as a squad because coming out of winning the World Cup in 2014, um, a load of the girls then went professional as sevens players. So we had, you know, looking forward to the Olympics in um, 2016 and the inclusions of sevens. I think, I think it was 12 players went professional and that was effectively our back line. So I was actually talking to my parents about it last night. So, you know, reminiscing on 2015, year after World Cup, you know, should you kick on, you know, first in the world, you know, you've got a target on your back. Um, and we went into that following Six Nations without a back line that had, you know, we literally lost everyone from 10 outwards. One of our nine stayed, the other nine went. Um, and you, you didn't have a chance to rebuild because we weren't in camp. We just went back to our day jobs, came into camp for the Six Nations. So we, we performed pretty badly, but actually as you might expect, having some experienced forwards and some very inexperienced backs and not much time to kind of bring that group together. Um, so, I, yeah, I wouldn't say that we necessarily um, did it right, uh, but it's, I think probably for a lot of people, the fact that we didn't play New Zealand in that final, for me personally anyway, will always be quite a big, a big thing beating New Zealand in the World Cup final, I think would be, for me, is always the, that would be the pinnacle. If you can get everything right on that particular day, not like it was in 2017, where we got everything right six weeks previously, beat them in New Zealand and then couldn't beat them when we met them in the World Cup final. Um, I think that's, even though we had won, I think people who, you know, had been around for a long time still had that in the back of their minds that, yeah, but, it wasn't New Zealand's year. They had got knocked out. The, you know, the system didn't allow them to come back through quarterfinals or or anything like that. So, but can um, you? I mean, do you not look at that and like, come on, girls, this is crazy. I mean, we can only beat what's in front of us. We worked so hard yeah. to win a World Cup. We've done it. I mean, just because they've tripped over, you know, I, I agree. You, know, you want to beat everyone along the way, but but in, equally, one of the things I heard from you there, 2015, was yeah, you know, learning for people is you, you've got to keep your best talent. Right, in order to keep consistency. Um, but another bit that I was interested in was, even though you'd lost these players and it was a different squad, you still had the same, I guess, philosophy or, or imagery or ideology of, of what great looked like, like what performance criteria needed to be met. So how did you manage through that if you knew it wasn't there? Yeah, I... I think, again, we're probably not a great example in that, you know, we, we lost those players to sevens. I think seven girls retired just from the game generally who played in that World Cup final. Um, both of our coaches left, our, our head coach and assistant coach, our medics left. So it really SCC was, left. we are peaking to this yeah. crescendo. Yeah. So and then kind of, yeah, we the, fall off the, a cliff and we'll start again. Yes, the rebuilding process was for, I mean, ideally, I reckon in those kind of scenarios, you'd have a, a bit of a contingency plan and you'd be like, maybe we'll take these people out, then these people, then these people. But actually what we ended up having was gone. This is what you're left with. Bam, let's go tomorrow. Um, how, how well was the, I mean, this sounds like business spiel, but like how well was the internal and external stakeholder management managed? i.e. you just won a World Cup, how well was the 
the public managed, right? Everyone sees you as number one in the world at this point. How well will they manage in terms of, by the way, this isn't the same team, it's not the same coaches. Seven of the players have gone, or 12 of the players have gone to sevens, blah, blah, blah. Loads have retired. Yeah, so managing expectations from that side. And then equally, how are the expectations managed internally within RFU, the squad, in terms of, look, we're not number one team in the world at the moment. Like, we, you know, we won it. But everyone's now left. This is a totally different team. So we're now building towards being number one team in the world in 2017 World Cup. Like, how was that managed? I think it's a fine balance, isn't it? Because that, that external, you don't want to just go to the media and say, look, you know, we've lost all these brilliant players. We've got these new ones in, like, not sure how they're going to perform. Um, it just sounds like you're making excuses. So I, I, I understand it's a, it is a really difficult challenge to, to get the right level of message across to those, you know, the supporters, the external stakeholders to say that just, you know, yes, we're number one. We work really hard for that. We're going to be in a rebuilding phase now. And these are our plans. This is, you know, this is the direction we're going in. And we're always going to aim to, you know, to keep that number one status but it's probably going to take us a few games, a few competitions you know, to build these players back in. And, you know, we've had a change in terms of the internal dynamics of, of the squad and the staff. And again, that will take a little bit of time. I don't, I don't know whether we got that completely right as a like internal external. I, I know from my point of view, I captained that six nations um, and I found it really difficult to have gone from what we were doing to trying to keep emulate emulating that when I knew that so much else had changed and I felt like we we kind of needed to take a bit of, of stock and and I don't know whether we spoke about it enough. I think probably if I had my time again in that situation, I'd want to sit down with the girls and probably with the staff and just say, right, look, this is where we're at. These are our, our expectations for this tournament in particular. We know we've got these new people. That's exciting. That's cool. Like, let's get an experienced player and an inexperienced player, let's buddy them up. Let's let's try and fast forward all that energy of you're new and excited and terrified because it's your first cap with you've had 79 caps to your country, played in two World Cups already. Um, I think we probably, yeah, we probably should have harnessed that a bit more, that this is, this is a good thing. This change is good. We're rebuilding. Um, and I don't think we did. Yeah, I'm really intrigued because that sort of segues quite nicely to my other question, right? Which is, what would you say is the most important part of like creating a team mindset or a collaborative mindset inside your team? You know, I don't. Know, what did you do well post the World Cup, and what did you do well pre the World Cup? Right, that, that created that sense of teamship that ultimately led to you being best in the world. Um, I do think that kind of making sure everybody feels valued and it's not it isn't easy to do in terms of everyone feeling like they've got a voice because like you sort of alluded to earlier Ollie you said what well, could like could just be carnage like everyone wanting to talk and no decisions being made and and I think that that did happen to us um, previously you know we had a a, back, a very good back line you know players that as individuals were brilliant um, and sometimes the energy and excitement around, are we going to do this move? I'm, I'm going to run this line. I'm going to be there. I think sometimes that was too much. There was too many voices. There wasn't a, no, this is where you need to be. This is what we're going to do. Um, and kind of what we, we reined that in a little bit leading into 2014, you know, there was just a little bit more structure in how we played, which, which helped kind of rein in those excited ideas. We had... Um, for the first time ever, we had a leadership group and that was formed by the players. So over like an 18 month period, people dipped into this leadership group, like you were, oh, you were nominated to be in it or you were asked to be in it for a camp or a competition. Um, and by the end of that kind of build up to the World Cup, we had a group of players who had been voted for by the players. So you had everybody's voices, but without everybody talking at the same time. And the, the wider group trusted that smaller leadership group enough to say there was someone in that group that everyone on the periphery could talk to. So maybe, you know, 
maybe I didn't connect with somebody very well, but there was another person in the group that that player could go to and get get themselves heard. And it, it definitely wasn't perfect. Um, but I think it made a massive difference is, is having, yeah, having voices heard and feeling valued when you're a bigger group. And if you can get that decided by the bigger group and, you know, narrowed down, narrowed down to a few people who you know are going to represent you and you trust that, that they're going to do that job and you, you feel confident. And as long as that smaller group has got the trust and the buy-in from the big boys, you know, the management or the bosses or the, you know, whatever level we're looking at there. And, and you know that when you speak on behalf of the players, that will get listened to because you're only speaking for the right reasons. You're doing it for a reason. You're not just, it's not just white noise. Yeah. I mean, what, so what I'm hearing for you is, I was going to ask you, you know, the subject of leadership and what I'm hearing from you is the best teams and the best environments you've ever been involved in are, there has been you know, a collective form of leadership, right? It's not been one person wearing the armband and, you know, they move forward. Is that always been the case? Has that always been where you've sort of seen like the best environments, the best teams from a leadership perspective have been that co- collective, collaborative leadership platform or lead- leadership methodology? Or have you been in teams where you're like, no, you know, Tamara's the boss. We need her to just make a call and we're doing it. Like, have you ever seen that? Or and, and if you have, what were the most important qualities of skills in either of those leadership environments? Doesn't matter, right? But I guess the question is, what would you see as the most important qualities or skills that a leader should have? And whatever your definition of, of leading is. I think I think if you've got that that foundation bit right, then you can have your your captain on the pitch you know, your leader making those decisions because you've already got the buy-in, you've already got the support of the rest of the team, but that doesn't just happen. You don't just give someone the captain's armband and that's it. They're a leader. They lead people, people follow them. Um, And I think sometimes in the past as coaches, people get that wrong and they go, Oh yeah, that person will be the right, right one for the job. They look like a leader, but actually they don't have the support of, of the whole squad. And that means that, the decisions that they make aren't necessarily either on, on behalf of everybody, but also maybe not always in the best interests of everybody. So I think if you haven't done that kind of that foundation piece of there's group buy-in, there's conversations, people feel valued, you're allowed to put your opinion across. And then over time that filters in, I think you can then get the right person at the top Um but it depends how much time you've got, right? Yeah. Um, to be able to to find the right person, I think. Um, so, Tam, on that, what would you say from your experience as being the best or exempl- exemplars of leadership? Like, what do they do, either as a group or as an individual? How do they make you feel? Yeah, I think good at listening, like, and not just listening for the sake of listening, but actually hearing what people are saying. Um, having that empathy and understanding to be able to want to listen to people's point of view, not to be, you know, I think the best leaders have, have taken that chip off their shoulder and that ego piece around, ah, oh, I'm the captain, this is about my status or I'm, I'm the chief here. Um, and they're doing it, they're, they're the voice of the people, they're the representative of the rest of the group. And actually it's not about them as the captain, it's, they just happen to be the mouthpiece, the spokesperson, the body that you know embodies the rest of the players or the rest of the group. Um, and I just don't think you can have that ego, power, captainy. I want, I want to be at the top. It has to be my name. I've got to have the armband because that stops you from being able to see the bigger picture. It suddenly becomes about what you're going to lose if you're not the leader anymore. Or you're not the captain, or you're not the head coach, or you're not the director of rugby so if if the status becomes more important than the job that you're you're supposed to be doing I think that's when like good leaders turn bad or or we get the wrong people um we get the people in those positions of power that that's what they want they want the power they love it and I think if you if you checked in with any of those people and found out that actually they're more worried about losing that armband or losing that status than they are about 
doing the job that's that's probably where we've got it wrong and the wrong person's there and, and Tam, having been a leader and having been led what what would you how did you know when it was going well and when you were being a really effective leader and how did you know when it i don't know you or they were not leading very well. What what were the things that were the triggers? I'm just trying to think of people listening would be like, well, I think I'm a good leader, but you know, I, I don't know. And like, so, so what did you do? Anything you did or anything that you responded to that I don't know, really was a telltale sign of like, wow, I'm, I'm leading very effectively or I need to up my game or, or change tact here. I think like that, the easy positive spots are the bit around, you know, what what's the vibe in the group? Are people asking you questions? Are they challenging some of the things that you're saying and not, you know, coming at you with a challenge, but saying, look, I was thinking this. Is that is that something you were thinking? Or I've looked at that and I'm not sure I've got this solution instead. I think if you've got people in your group that are, that are coming to you like that and and you're finding that there's there's different opinions to your own, then I think you're doing a good job leading because you've got a group of people there who feel confident enough. You know, a leader doesn't know everything. A captain does not know everything. And the best leaders use the people around them to help support what they already know or, you know, the decisions that they're happy to make. And God, I I just love the fact that you can have someone at the top, but it's not just you. It's it's 30 other people's information. Like how brilliant can that make the group as a whole? If you've got all the, like all the right bits, it's not just me going, well, I think this, I think this, oh, this, per-, like just, you're just getting bigger and better because you've got all of that joint and shared information. Um, and I, I really think you can feel it when it's going well, that, that people want to, to put their opinion across. They're not, you know they're not saying you're wrong but they're like look this might help might not fair play it might not um and they're listening and communicating with each other as well it's not everyone just stopping you're talking okay right yeah head down or just go and do what you said there's there's other dialogue going on around I'm not saying talking over you while you're talking if you're giving you know an explanation or something but you can feel it in the room or you can feel it on the pitch that people have gone right yeah we're doing that okay this is how me and you are going to work to be able to do that. This is how we are. Oh, can I just check? If I do this, is that what you meant? Yeah. I think that's real leadership where you maybe don't feel like a leader, but actually that means you're leading. How important was it then that, you, because you're talking around a feeling and knowing through emotion and uh, if you've never experienced that, if you've never been exposed to a great leadership and then you're being asked to lead, how would you say you tackle that? I mean, you were fortunate enough that you came through an environment whereby maybe you experienced great leaders and bad leaders, right? Um, what happens if you've just been exposed to bad leadership the whole way through? So you don't really... Like, to your exa- example of New Zealand, like you've never been beaten by them. So you don't actually know what, what good looks like. You just know what bad performance like or bad bad delivery is. And, and you, you would think that's actually good. Like how, how, how do you think you break that mould? Have you ever seen that or experienced that? Yeah, that's, it's really difficult. And I, I often think about that in terms of my coaching when I feel like I haven't connected with a player very well because they, they don't have that same kind of empathy or understanding that there may be. The, the players I struggle with the most are the ones who, who don't really feel what the vibe is in the group. They're there, they're playing, they're loving it, they're... They're pretty tunnel visioned in terms of I'm doing this for this reason for me. Um, and because I've never been like that, I, I struggle to connect more with those types of people because I, I find them selfish because I wasn't like that. It doesn't mean that they are selfish, but they're, they're just very far removed from, from how I was or, or have been as a player. So I find bridging that gap difficult. Um, I think a lot of it is, is around getting to know that, that person um, in terms of that player coach relationship to try and then understand it. But I think, I honestly think some of it is because, yeah, like you said, you've not seen it. They've not seen it. Um, they haven't had to be like that. There hasn't had to be a, a kind of a, a bigger team picture for them. It's always been about that person being a superstar. Um, and if you've only ever seen negative leadership or negative, how do you know that it's, how do you know that it's negative? That's just what, you know, what you've always seen. So 
I think some of it is around trying to expose people to other environments so that they can see that maybe this is this is a different style of leadership and actually what you've been seeing for the last five years let's go over here into this environment see what do you, this person's do, doing do you, need, do you need to drive that yourself I is that you know or is that a coach's responsibility to give them exposure to different environments because you know a leader might just be like well why do I want to go and show them over there because they might, they might leave my team or they might think I'm rubbish or they might realize I'm I'm poor so you know, if you're that type of leader or that type of coach that type of player you're probably not going to say go and have a look over there because it's much better you know the grass is greener over that side of the fence so so wh where does the responsibility lie for that I guess probably in that sense it's it's with the the people who are being led by that that bad leader in that sense so um if you I, I think that kind of it goes back to that change piece I'm not saying you're going to change and you go to a different job or whatever but you need to see something that's different we get quite stuck in our our workplaces or our lives with well this is what I've always done this is what I see and unless you actually go out into the bigger world and just go right I'm going to I'm going to go into that environment. I'm going to go to that different workplace. I'm going to go on that webinar, something that I don't understand and I've never been a part of before because I'm going to go and see how they do that. And you might take nothing from it, but the more varied experiences we have or the different environments that are, you know, diverse environments that we go into, I think the, the kind of broader our mind is in terms of, oh, well, I've never seen that. I could take something from that. Never seen that, but I didn't like it we get a better understanding of the environment that we're in and how we might be able to improve it. So we're talking about context. One thing you left out at the beginning was that you are a two time world record holder for going up <laughs> Mount Everest to set two world records on Mount Everest. All these things that you've spoken around were obviously in contextually in an environment that was very familiar for you. You'd been living, breathing, playing rugby, what, I mean, best part of all your life right so so how did you apply these things the, the, these belief sets or whatever else into an environment that you had no background no familiarity around that was challenging hostile being on the biggest baddest mountain in the world that is mount everest to go and do something that no one's ever ever done before what how did you how did you apply yourself to that and, and how would you critique yourself on that and the others around you? Um, I think probably what I did do in the end was reverted back to type and put my head down and just tried to get on with it to get the job done. Um, again, I, I've looked back on that Everest trip and thought, oh, I don't think I enjoyed the ride because I was so worried that I was going to fail, I was going to let people down, I wasn't going to make it to the, you know, to advance base camp to referee that game for the second game. Um, I, I definitely look back on that and go, oh, Tamara, why didn't you learn from what you've been thinking about from your rugby career and make sure that you really enjoyed some of those moments? Um, but I definitely let my, that kind of emotional side of me, that fear of failure take over at times. You might not have known it, you might not have seen it because I try and hide it still. Um, but I would wake up every day, in, especially at base camp, when I wasn't feeling very well um, early on and I'd had these terrible headaches and I'd had to get turned around on um, one of the first walks. I was just in my tent in the morning thinking, is today, like, is today going to be the day? Am I going to let everyone down? Am I going to be the first female to leave the mountain? Am I going to be the first captain to not make this? You know, am I going to stop the team um, from being able to play the game at advanced base camp because I'm the only referee left standing that isn't playing? Um, so I just piled all of that stress onto myself on a daily basis, um, which probably meant that, yeah, I didn't enjoy the ride as well. Um, but probably the, the strong point about the reverting back to type bit was I did just eventually just put my head down and I definitely swore at you a few times, Ollie, um, <laughs> but just... Just get there, just get there, get the job done, make sure that everyone can do it and we haven't failed and then let's get down and get some oxygen. <laughs> but, but then having gone through that process and having succeeded, right, and 
I don't know, quashed all these fears of I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to make it, I'm going to be the first captain off the mountain or whatever else was going through your mind. Like having had none of that happen or materialize, what, like what, what would be your reflections? Like what would be your learnings to take away from that? that I'm just trying to think of people listening to this. Like they probably go through those experiences. I go through those experiences all the time in different scenarios, like of, I've got two kids, three kids. How am I going to support them and live up to them? And, oh, my God, I might lose my job tomorrow and then we might be out on the street. And da, da, da. Our life is filled with worry and ang- anxiety, right? But ha- what would be your reflections and your takeaways to sort of say, you know what, next time I go up Everest or if, if I do that again or if I'm faced with a similar scenario, like I- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach this differently because that's the benefit of, as you mentioned, a World Cup like experience. But if it was Einstein's definition of insanity is just doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different outcome. So, you know, so how do you address the balance? Like otherwise, you go up the next mountain, you're filled with the same fears, you won't enjoy the journey. You're like, have you have you addressed it or have you sort of thought, you know what, these are the things that I'm going to do. I, I'm going to love willing and focus on the experience and I mean, it's, it's quite hard to say I'm just going to remove the fear of failure from my mind. I'm just wondering what you, what you, wh- how you process it or if you just go, oh, well, that's how I dealt with it. I'll just deal with the next one. I think probably going back to that, the, the kind of mental or the support network, the, the kind of talking side of it, I think um, it was obviously a bit different on a mountain to be able to bring home and, uh, and have a chat with someone. Um, because we didn't have any signal for half of the half the time we we're up there, but I I do think that I'm better if I'm speaking to people. But when I get um, when I'm at my worst, I isolate myself and I I pull back from people. I know I do that. Well, I've learned more probably over the last three years that that's my behaviour. When I get stressed, I'll like blend into the background as much as I can. But actually, what I need is I need to talk to people. I need to connect. So. I guess either if it's a group of people, so say I was back in England camp, I would, and I did start to use my roommate a lot more in terms of just little, 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 get all the information out. Brilliant. And you feel better whether anything comes out of it or not, but to get some of those worries or, or, you know, just basic stuff. I feel a bit stressed today. Okay, cool. Should we have a coffee? Yeah, cool. Even if it's not any, you know, any detail or emotion, I think sometimes just, telling someone that you're nervous or telling someone you're scared you're going to fail it just takes just takes a little bit of of that weight off you even if you don't really do anything about it so I think in the environment where I know people I would speak more openly about it and in that you know that Everest we just came together we went up a mountain um is maybe trying to find someone that I can talk to within that group or speak to someone completely away so had I been able to pick up the phone and speak to my partner or speak to my dad or whatever um and tell them that but knowing that i was going to use them for that purpose if you know what i mean yeah yeah so i mean so that's known as priming right but 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 you know around that so because what i what i'm thinking around is what well, i'm going to ask you the question but do you when, when you feel like that i imagine it's even harder to then be like oh well i'm just going to go and talk to somebody about this because i feel overcome and overwhelmed by you know the, these feelings of whatever it is anxiety negativity whatever else so how important is the role of priming in in that i i before you go up the mountain back in the uk look ollie i'm, I'm pretty shit scared about this i'm nervous i'm worried these are the things and then how important is it the role of that mentor or me, you know, that you've got to come forward continually to be asking questions Right, to like, where are you? Like, what's happening today? Da, da, da. Like, do you think that would help you? Or, or, or I mean, I'm, I'm just really intrigued. I'm fascinated by it because for someone that achieves so much, you know, it's obviously still laced with, my God, I, I never thought I would and I, or I could. And even though you've done it, the, the environments you still go into still happens again. So I'm just wondering, what, like, how, because I think loads of people can relate to that. Yeah, I, th- I think definitely fi- like the hard part is is finding that person, isn't it? All those people that you have the trust with, you know, won't judge you, 
you know that they've got the time as well you know to be able to have those conversations with you um and more often than not you actually just need them to listen you know i'm i'm quite a a fixer my personality is like if there's a problem i want to fix it and i want to make stuff better and you know everything's fluffy and nice and unicorns um so what i've actually learned as well over the last few years is that you can't fix everything and sometimes fixing it involves not fixing it and someone just telling you that they're feeling really down today or they're struggling with something and you just listening and going yeah that that's I've never had that happen to me and that you know that is that's a bad thing I, I can only imagine how you know how sad that must make you feel and and I thought that wasn't helping I thought I had to have solutions as that you know that mental or that support network but you know the more we talk about mental health and, and supporting people around that it's actually a lot of it is just allowing that person to talk and I think probably that's what I needed and probably still do need is to just be able to go ah, this is happening this is happening okay I'm done I'm over it and for you or you know whoever I'm speaking to to not then go oh my goodness she said all this stuff what you know what does it mean is us having a relationship that you know that I just need to deload sometimes and we might have solutions we may have a great conversation about it but other times I it doesn't have not. to mean anything yeah, yeah it can yeah. just be I just need to tell someone that I'm really stressed and I've got all this nervous energy. Okay, I've told you. Okay, right. Back, I'm going to go do that thing. <laughs> also, and I was, and, and in closing on that, then I'm guessing the importance around that is consciously building your, you know, your super team, your support network or whatever that, that you feel like you can do that with. Yeah, and I, I did a, a mental health first aid course recently, which like was really good, like really made me think about stuff in different ways obviously there's there's so many things around mental health that we don't know and I you know having even just having done a course I know even less I feel like um but there's there's such a kind of especially I think around for for men you're not really supposed to talk you're not supposed to look like you're having to rely on somebody else there's still quite a you know a macho thing around this well if you you know, if you tell someone that you're scared or you don't go and get that spider because you're the man, um, you're less of a man. And, and society, we've, just, we've done this to ourselves. And I think that the, the more we can normalise talking, the more we can normalise it, it's OK to say that you're scared or it's OK to say that you're worried. And that doesn't mean that you're any less of anything. It's normal. You know, I said right at the beginning that your life does this. I, I've talked about it from an elite sports side of things but you wake up in the morning you have a great day you'll be really positive and come 2 p.m in the afternoon something minor to everybody else will happen and it'll put you on a downer and it's realizing that 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 is life it's not happy and sunflowers every single day and but that's normal and that's okay and you can go and talk to somebody and let a bit of steam off and that's okay as well no one's going to judge you on that Tammy that's an awesome way to end I think that's amazing. I mean, I, uh, I mean, I just want to say thanks, uh, Tam. It's been a, such a. I mean, I've I've run over a bit as always, but um, you know, thank you so much t- for coming on for Chang. I think I could talk again. I think with there's so much more to talk around. But um, Tamara Taylor, you're a hero. I um, love having you as my friend. But thanks ever so much for the time. Thanks, Ollie. It's been great. Thank you.